welcome. We appreciate y'all coming here tonight. We've got a couple of fun things in store for y'all. The first the thing I would like to do is if you are a library staff yeah. member, would you please raise your hand and the rest of you, would you please put yours together and thank the library staff for an amazing job. We're very honored to have our retired astronauts here, our mayor, Mike Foreman, Jerry Ross, which I do, I'm staying in front of all of them. He has his books at the back. His wife is there. and We'd love for you to grab one of those on your way out. Please, and we please pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> and Bill MacArthur. So I just want to say thank you so much. We are so, so fortunate to be here in Friendswood where we have so much of this rich history related to the Apollo 11 50th anniversary right here in our own backyard. And I am very pleased to um, have been a part of trying to pull all this together, but it was really Mayor Mike's idea, and we're excited that he wanted to do this, and you know, go guess, retired astronaut. But we do have a very special announcement, a presentation, before we get started with Ask an Astronaut, and I believe that Mayor Mike is going to handle that for us. Well, part of this uh, celebration, this month-long Apollo 11 50th anniversary celebration was an art contest that, that we ran in all the Friendswood schools. And McKenna, you want to raise your hand? One of our art teachers, McKenna Giamfortone. How'd I do? You did great. Thank you. Appreciate it. That's a tough one. She, uh, she helped uh, the kids with their art projects and uh, selected the winners. Somebody selected the winners. We have winners. And let me read who the winners are. <clears throat> There were no places assigned, but three uh, students were selected from each school. So uh, from Bales, Kaylin Wilson. Kaylin, are you here? A team of Natalie Martin and Darian Williams. Great job. And Finally, Bridget Murphy, also from Bales. And from Westwood, Joseph Ford. Any relation to you, sir? No, no relation. Hey, Joseph. Glad you're here. Did you guys already get your prizes? Or? Congratulations, Joseph. Yeah, we gave some kids out. <laughs> you, you already got your prizes, so. Madeline Schmidt. Hey, it's Madeline. I couldn't stand up here. You'll be good. And Grant Berry. So those are the winners from Westwood. Congratulations to all them. Good job, Grant. Awesome. Well done. Well done. So thank you for all the people that participated in our art contest. Um, it's the arts in the community room. The arts in the community room. Check it out. Yes, thank you. Okay, now uh, over to you, Jeff. Uh, good evening. Thank Welcome you, to the uh, Friendswood Library. We're pleased to have another big crowd for another Apollo 11 anniversary event. Before we start our program tonight, um, a sad announcement. Uh, earlier today, NASA's first flight director, Chris Kraft, passed away. So let's take a moment and have a moment of silence in his honor and memory. Thank you. Tonight is Ask an Astronaut. And I'm going to ask a couple questions because I'm not a space geek, but I'm close. I'm a space nut. But I'm also going to rely on you to ask questions. If you don't want to have the microphone brought to you, you can text your question to the number on the screen. <laughs> Please don't use Jerry. this number after the program is over, or I will call you back at 2 a.m. <laughs> well. We want to introduce our panel from your left is Jerry Ross. He's a graduate with multiple degrees from Purdue University, 
retired Air Force, and retired astronaut. Jeremy Ross shares the record with another astronaut for being launched into space seven times, and each time he came back. <laughs> he was with yes. the shuttle program from before the final, before the first launch until after the final landing. And he did spacewalks 57 hours and 55 minutes. Okay. Terry Ross also was working on the space station program from inception through the initial operation of the space station. So that's Jerry Ross on your left. In the center is Mike Foreman. He's a graduate of the United States Naval Academy and also the United States Naval Postgraduate School and he's retired from the U.S. Navy. Mike Foreman flew on two space shuttle flights, performed five spacewalks totaling more than 32 hours, Mike is in his second year serving as the mayor of Friendswood, and in the interest of full disclosure, my boss is his boss. So, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and then our, uh, our third panelist is Bill MacArthur. Bill is a graduate of the United States Military Academy and also the Georgia Institute of Technology. He's a retired U.S. Army, retired NASA astronaut, and director of safety and mission assurance for the Johnson Space Center. Mr. MacArthur flew four times and did spacewalks for 24 hours and 21 minutes. And he lived on the International Space Station for six months. Wow. That's nice. Those are our panelists tonight. My first question to you, gentlemen, is was there an event or a series event in your life that helped you pursue the idea of being an astronaut? And we're going to just let you all do the mic. I'm not going to call on you. You know, first, before I pass the mic to Jerry to answer that question, I want to point out to you, did you hear the, the EVA, the spacewalking time? If you add Bill and my spacewalking time, they don't quite equate to Jerry's spacewalking time. <laughs> did you all do the math real quick when that was going on? I just want to point that out. I did. <laughs> <laughs> You're a math genius. Yeah, whoa, whoa. Sorry. Uh, Interesting question, Jeff. I, I'm old enough that I grew up before the first satellites were launched into space. And uh, people started talking about that when I was in about the first grade. And that totally captivated my imagination. I thought at one time maybe I'd be a farmer like my, one of my grandfathers or maybe I'd be a professional baseball player and I found out that you had to be good at that and <laughs> kind of took that one off the list. But literally, I was captivated by the thoughts of flying uh, rockets and satellites into space, and I started making scrapbooks about that with the help of my mother. And by making those scrapbooks, I found out that it was scientists and engineers that were doing that work. And since a lot of the articles were written about uh, Purdue graduates being from my home state of Indiana, that uh, I learned about this place called Purdue. And I was in the fourth grade when the first satellites were launched into space, and I decided then and there when I was about 10 years old that I was going to go to Purdue University, that I was going to become an engineer, and I wanted to get involved in our country's space program. Now, I didn't say anything about astronaut in there anywhere, did I? Because there were no astronauts. There was only Flash <coughs> Gordon and guys like that running around on, this, on the science fiction channel, which there wasn't one back then. But um, So as I continued to uh, pursue my education, uh, all the money I made working on farms and everything else went into a special bank account to help to pay for my uh, education. And as I got older and uh, we started flying uh, not only satellites but people into space, I started to refine my goals to finally to the point where I thought, if I'm going to be in a space program, the neatest place to be will be at the pointy end of the rocket. And so that's where I started to uh, put my uh, direction of uh, emphasis. And I was fortunate enough to, to eventually get selected to be an astronaut and not only to be, become an astronaut, but to fly in space seven times and do nine spacewalks. Pretty incredible. incredible. I've been blessed in many, many ways. Well, I grew up in the state of Ohio. <clears throat> and, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when I was eight years old, I decided I wanted to become an astronaut because uh, we heard a lot about astronauts when I was eight years old. So Jerry's about 20 years older than me. So. Uh, you know, I, they did have astronauts when I was eight years old, and a couple of them were from Ohio, and so the news media in Ohio 
picked up on that routinely. Couldn't go a day or two without reading an article or seeing something on TV about these guys. Neil Armstrong, John Glenn, Jim Lovell. Jim Lovell, who you all know is Tom Hanks from the movie Apollo 13. <laughs> People always ask me, you know, there's more astronauts from Ohio than any other state. And they say, Mike, why so many astronauts from Ohio? And I just tell them the truth. It's just a lot of people looking for work outside the state. <laughs> but uh, truthfully, you know, when I decided to become an astronaut, I had to first figure out how do you become an astronaut? And that's when I studied how the original seven astronauts had become astronauts and realized that four out of the seven original astronauts had been uh, naval aviators. That's a pilot, neither the Navy or the Marine Corps. So. You know, by then, I'm probably about nine years old. I put this all together in my nine-year-old brain and said, well, it sounds like uh, naval aviators have the best chance of becoming astronauts. So I, I told my parents I was going to become a Navy pilot and an astronaut. And my dad's the one that said, well, you ought to check out this place called the Naval Academy. And I said, what's the Naval Academy? And he said, well, you're pretty good at doing this research on astronauts. Why don't you find out about the Naval Academy? So we had World Book Encyclopedias, and they had a three-page uh, spread there in the U volume, you know, United States Naval Academy, and it told me a little bit about the Naval Academy, but not enough, so I wrote them a, a letter, and they sent me a college catalog, and I remember looking at that thing, at the time, it had pictures of guys playing every sport imaginable, you know, football, baseball, golf, soccer, swimming, basketball, sports I'd never heard of growing up in Ohio, like lacrosse, rugby, fencing, and I said, wow, yeah, this looks like uh, summer camp, I wanna go here. Um, <laughs> Didn't show a lot of pictures of guys sitting in class all day studying aerospace engineering, but you know you find out later uh, what college is more about. But I, uh, I worked really hard on my grades, and I was able to get into the Naval Academy and uh, followed my dream and uh, applied eight times. Uh, so while Jerry was an astronaut for a long time, I applied to be an astronaut for a long time, and then finally on my eighth application, I was selected, and then. Uh, Got to work for Jerry, actually, as an astronaut. Jerry was my boss there for a little while, and we did some good things together. So that, that's really what, what sparked my interest, was just, I think, all those Ohio astronauts that you know were in the news all the time, and a bunch of my astronaut compatriots you know, from my generation from Ohio, I think all followed that same, followed that same dream. Ooh, eight times. Go <laughs> tell me about that I, one time I, you applied. I, I, seven. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm and I'm convinced. I bet you're the same way. They finally figured the only way to get you to stop applying was to get bring in the program. See what you look like. Yeah. So, um, well, I I was actually uh, nine years old when uh, the first uh, humans flew in space, and I, I thought that I was av I just love science fiction, but. I kind of never saw myself doing that. My dad uh, served in World War II. He was in Patton's Third Army, and he uh, came back, and um, uh, up until uh, he passed away, he was in the Army Reserves. I mean, he was including uh, Special Forces at uh, Fort Bragg. And uh, I wanted to be like my dad. Uh, I, I, so I, I, as far back as I can remember, I wanted to be a soldier. Uh, <coughs> and if you want to be a soldier, a good thing to do is go to West Point, right, Tyler? <laughs> but anyhow, uh, so um, and so that worked. That worked out, and uh, and so I found myself on the first of July, nineteen sixty-nine, uh, wondering if I'd made a big mistake or not, as all the upperclassmen are screaming at me. But um, survived, and twenty days later, July twentieth, nineteen sixty-nine. They had us all fall out after dinner in formation, and they marched us to one of the to the largest academic building on campus, and put us in uh, one of the auditoriums. Uh, all 1,442 of us, uh, uh, brand new cadets, and so we sat there, desperately trying to awake. It's trying to stay awake. I, I don't know if it was because we knew we were seeing something historic unfold in front of us, or because we knew the upperclassmen would. Make, make our lives miserable if they called us uh, dozing off. So uh, so we sat there and we watched uh, Neil Armstrong uh, um, set foot on the set foot on the moon. Okay, that, that was good. I'm still going to be a soldier. Um, graduated uh, with an engineering degree. Um, went to flight school um, and I thought that was kind of neat flying having studied aerospace engineering and flying that seemed to seem to go together pretty well and I just wanted to do more of that. Uh, a graduate degree then uh, I, I and well even before that uh, suddenly something odd happened in 1978 
NASA selected 35 new astronauts for the space shuttle program. And it was a very different group of astronauts than they had selected before. Uh, it had the first women uh, astronauts, the first African American astronauts, the first Asian uh, American astronaut, and the first Army astronaut. <laughs> I'm going, holy smoke, what is that? And so it's a gentleman named Bob Stewart, and I read, read about Bob, and uh, his early career looked a little bit like mine, and uh, some of the things he subsequently, d subsequently did that appeared to m uh, make him qualified to be an astronaut were things that I, I was either, I either aspired to do or I w they were already in my, uh, the career plan that the Army had for me. And so I, I kept doing those things. Um, got uh, interviewed for the, uh, in 1986, was not selected then, but was, uh, but uh, NASA asked the Army to send me, you may, you may recall the, the uh, uh, Columbia tragedy, uh, Columbia, the Challenger tragedy in 1986, and so uh, NASA asked the Army to send me, uh, send me down here to, uh, um, to help uh, support the astronaut office and the post-Challenger return to flight efforts. And, um, and after I'd been here three years, uh, folks at NASA in the local community had, had gotten to uh, know my wife, who was a kindergarten teacher in uh, CCISD, and they realized if they didn't select me that the Army was going to move me somewhere, and that meant my wife would leave the community, and so they said I could stay as long as she did. <laughs> Who's, who has a question? Raise your hand. If not, I'll take one from the... Okay. Sorry. Really loud. How is it like being an astronaut? Well, I think it's the best job in the world. Uh, and I've even been the mayor here. So I, I think, you know, astronaut's a pretty cool job. You get to fly in space and see the Earth from uh, pretty high up. You know, we're up there about 250 miles high. Bill's even been higher because Bill went and serviced the uh, Hubble. Mm -mm. No. Mm -mm. Bill hasn't been that high. Mm -mm. <laughs> Bill's not really sure where he's been. <laughs> no, it's a great, great uh, job floating in space. You know, weightlessness is really cool. It'd be awesome if we could turn off gravity in this room for a couple of minutes and we'd all get to float around and experience that. We'd all be bumping into each other and it'd be kind of crazy, yeah. but it'd be a fun experience, I'll tell you. So it's pretty cool being an astronaut. Good for you. I went to space camp. You went to space camp? Today. Well, they didn't have space camp when we were kids. You went today, didn't you? <laughs> you have a question? Okay. All right. Um, I've got a question. I'll come to the adults in just a moment. If we're I, kind of I, just have, I just have a comment. I couldn't keep quiet. Okay. Cool. I'm originally from Ohio. 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 I'm originally from Ohio. And when, when I was that little, about that little girl's size and age, my dad, brother, and I went to a drive-in movie. So that dates me, number one. Number two, we saw a science fiction movie called Destination Moon. And then as I grew older, I did watch John Glenn, we moved to Florida, watch John Glenn go initially the first time. And then I've taught school and the second time he went up, my principal took myself and my <clears throat> class in a special room with a special TV just for us because she knew I went up first time. And that was really special. And I love Friendswood with all this activity. It's wonderful. Between the time you were an astronaut candidate and the time you actually flew, this is a question that was texted, what was the most difficult thing you did as a person what was the most difficult activity that NASA had you do? Now that you're retired, you can tell on them a little bit. Okay, well, it's pretty easy for me to identify it. I was selected as an astronaut in 1980, and my first flight was in November of 1985. So I was selected before the shuttle started flying, so it was several years before it flew, and then weren't very many flights for the first several years, and we had a bunch of, you know, a backlog of people in front of us, us new guys. But the thing that was hardest for me was, uh, <laughs> that right there. <laughs> yeah. Should we move a little bit further to the left? <laughs> I think it was me. Okay. Okay. I went out of orbit there, I think. Okay, great. With some of that galactic uh, stuff going on. MMOD impact. Yeah. Uh, 
Basically, uh, when you go into astronaut training, one of the things you're supposed to do is demonstrate proficiency in swimming so that you can be put into a spacesuit in the water tanks where we train to do spacewalks. I swim precisely like a rock. I mean, exactly like it. And uh, if you can't demonstrate a proficiency in swimming, they won't train you to be a spacewalker. Well, you, you heard that I've done nine spacewalks. I still can't swim. But uh, the, uh, the people that did the, uh, the certification on me, on all of us, uh, took some uh, special precautions or special interests in me and uh, took me into the, the pool and verified that I didn't float and I didn't swim. And after they figured that out, that I wasn't afraid of the water, I just couldn't do that, they put uh, a snorkel and a uh, mask and fins on me and let me demonstrate normal kinds of swimming things that way, which I was able to do quite easily. And then they put me into scuba gear and uh, allowed me to uh, certify that way. And the final thing you have to do for the scuba certification was to get into your scuba gear, dive down to the bottom of a 25 foot deep pool, take off all of your equipment, go to the surface, grab a breath of air and then dive back down, find your equipment and put it all back on including clearing, clearing your mask and everything else. And I, I was either going to do that or I was going to not do that and probably die in the process of trying. But when I did that, then I never let my scuba certification ever lapse again because I knew I probably would never be able to do that again. So, But that was uh, probably the hardest thing from my perspective in astronaut training. Thank goodness I was already scuba certified when I showed up. <laughs> I went to the Naval Academy. <laughs> uh, it, it, you know, and before I went to test pilot school, I had to go to Navy survival swimming out, in, out on the West Coast. That was fun. Okay. Um, the, I, uh, my, story's, my, my story of what was difficult is not nearly as much as uh, Jerry's, but uh, so I became an astronaut candidate in 1990, and the the shuttles the shuttle flight rate was really starting to accelerate so we were flying we were flying a lot there were a lot of flight opportunities and i think the hardest thing was just waiting for that first uh, uh that first uh, first call i remember uh, the chief of the office at the time was dan brandenstein and i was out on travel somewhere and he called me up and he says hey i got a flight assignment for you and i said oh that's good and he said now it involves medical research and i said i'll do anything and he goes no, 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 no. We don't want you to volunteer for all, all, all of this stuff. You don't want to give the doctors carte blanche to, to do with you as they will. So uh, I, think, I think it was just that, that waiting to get your turn was hard. Yeah, for me, uh, I, I spent a little longer uh, waiting. Uh, you know, I was selected in 1998. In 1996, as, uh, NASA selected the largest astronaut class they've ever selected. They had 44 people in that astronaut class. I actually interviewed for that class, but uh, came down here, went through all the medical tests, and then didn't get selected. So then, you know, that was the seventh time I had applied. And, you know, the rejection was getting a little harder to take. Now, you know, you interviewed, you actually talked to them, they saw you, and they didn't select you into the biggest astronaut class they'd ever selected. So, <laughs> so a little bit disheartening, but. Um, you know, I came back and interviewed again two years later and got selected finally in 1998 on my eighth try. But uh, following the, the what we call the sardines, because there are so many of them in that 1996 class, um, that uh, we knew there's an unwritten rule that you'll never fly in space, you'll never get an assignment before an astronaut that's been selected before you gets an assignment. So we had to wait for 44 astronauts to get their assignments, and there were still people ahead of them in the 95 class, I think, that had not been selected for a flight yet. So we're waiting, waiting, waiting. And uh, I got a call in December of 2002 from the chief of the astronaut office. At that time, a guy named Kent Rominger. And Rommel called me and he said, hey, Mike, uh, you got a second? And I said, yes, sir, w what can I do for you? And he said, uh, you know what I'm calling you about? I said, am I in trouble? I was joking. <laughs> he said, why, did you do something wrong? <laughs> I said, let's back this conversation up. Uh, Hello? <laughs> and that's, he called to assign me to a mission that was going to fly in February of 2004. So I had, would have been there a little over five years by the time my first flight assignment. February 1st, 2003 was a bad day for NASA. We lost Columbia that day. 
this is about three months after I've gotten that call and been assigned to a mission. So for the next three and a half years, we worked very hard to get ourselves back to flying again and uh, sort out all the, the problems that we had prior to Columbia and fix those things as best we could and move on. And so in that interim period, you know, all the flight assignments were sort of, uh, you know, wadded up and thrown away and, and we jumbled crews and so uh, then we moved forward. So in the end, I flew my first mission on SDS-123 in March of 2008, almost 10 years from the time that I got here. So probably the hardest thing, you know, that I did while I was there was that recovery, you know, going through the Columbia recovery, those guys had an office about three doors down from my office when I was up there on the astronaut office uh, floor that, that year, and so it was tough. Those were seven really good people, really good friends of all of us, and uh, so that was definitely a difficult time. Okay, another question from back here. I just figured it out. These are the kids that don't have their own phones yet, so they're not texting us. <laughs> How did Neil Armstrong affect your life? Did you know Neil Armstrong was from Ohio? <laughs> he definitely affected my life quite a bit. In fact, you know, it's funny, he was from Wapakoneta, Ohio. You want to try to say that? Wapakoneta. So uh, there's, a, there's a museum in Wapakoneta uh, talking about all the things that Neil Armstrong did in his career, including landing on the moon. And, and uh, they invited me to come back there this past weekend to be a part of a, 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 an event. I said, well, I got too many events going on in Friendswood, I can't leave, so. Uh, but Neil was one of those guys in the first two classes of astronauts that really had a strong effect on me uh, getting interested in, in, the, in the space program, you know, because like I said, he was one of those Ohio astronauts that I heard about all the time. So he definitely had a strong influence on me. And he was a great guy, you know, got to meet him a few times, very humble, very down to earth, you know, if I can use that term. Uh, to apply to an astronaut, very, you know, he shunned the limelight, you know, and uh, it was just, uh, he was a, just a real pleasure, great American. Okay, another question we have is um, the countdown. Let's say it's about 30 seconds before liftoff. How fast is your heart beating? What are you thinking about? Can you describe that, what you remember from your first launch? Gimbal chat. <laughs> well, uh, you're in the vehicle for several hours before you actually lift off. And at, at, well, there's a, a hold in the countdown at nine minutes. And that's 10 minute hold? Mm -hmm. 20 minute hold. Anyhow, you're kind of uh, bored somewhat laying in the vehicle until that point and you're starting to get a little bit sore and stiff. There's, you know, oxygen bottles sticking in your back and all that kind of stuff and uh, but when you come out of that nine minute hold then things start to happen pretty quickly and you know you're going to go unless something uh, bad happens so to speak and at 30 seconds then uh, the, the onboard computers on the space shuttle have taken over the countdown and your, your, your heart rate does go up I think the, the palms of your hands start to sweat a little bit uh, and you're, you have this um, uh, anticipation, I guess is the best way to put it, of, of all of that training and all that effort you put into it, you're about ready to put it to the test and to see if you're going to pass or not. As well as all the hardware that all those people at the Cape have been working on and testing and everything else, it's going to be put to the test too. Four and a half million pounds of hardware, six and a half million pounds of thrust, and in eight and a half minutes you go from standing on the, the launch pad to 100 miles up and traveling at five miles a second. It's a quite a ride. And literally, I, my first flight was the 23rd flight overall of the shuttle program. And back early in the program, we had very thorough, detailed debriefings after every mission. And uh, the crew would come in and tell the entire astronaut office everything they'd seen and did and experienced and heard. What had worked in training, what had not worked in training, what surprises did they have. Everything that they could possibly help us to try to learn so that we wouldn't have to relearn that on our flights. And I, I had listened to that. I had taken a lot of very detailed notes. Uh, when I was out at the, at the gym working out or running on the track, I would kind of daydream about what it was going to be like when I finally got a chance to go fly. And I thought I had it pretty well nailed. But I have to tell you that about 15 seconds after liftoff, I can remember literally thinking to myself, Ross, what are you doing here? <laughs> because it was a lot more dynamic, a lot more shaking and noise and vibration than I had uh, imagined. And I thought I had a pretty good imagination, and I thought I had the, uh, 
the knowledge base in pretty good shape. But it was an exciting ride. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, I always tell people, space shuttle launch feels a little bit like a car wreck. Uh, if you've ever been at a stop sign in your car and somebody has hit you from behind, that's what it feels like because the solid rocket boosters strapped to the side of the space shuttle, they're either on or off. And when they come on, they come on 100%. And like Jerry said, six and a half million pounds of thrust and you definitely know you're going somewhere. You just hope it's not Disney World. <laughs> so, so, and, and Jerry was right on it, 31 seconds. Uh, you, you really know you're either gonna fly that day or you're not. I mean, there's no, well, let's wait here for a little while. I mean, you really, you, you, your, your ability to hold within that, uh, within that uh, time frame is very, very limited and it has a lot to do with uh, the, what, what the lot of, uh, liquid oxygen is doing. But I, I, I found it almost, especially with the first launch, it was this excitement that almost had a serene aspect to it because, um, I mean, for, for me personally, I had applied, my, my seven applications were over a 10 year period. Um, and I'm sure Mike's, uh, Mike's eight were, were somewhere in that uh, time frame. And then, and then I was flying three years after getting selected. So this was a 13 year time period in which I wanted to do something and now tell me it was 20 years for you <laughs> oh god but but anyhow and so now you i mean you really are uh you, i mean this this is a this is kind of a binary thing if nothing else happens in your life once you launch you have you you are now truly a space voyager you're truly now an, a, an astronaut and um we, we we kind of formalize things and we say uh, you know, your first year or two of training, you're an astronaut candidate, and then you get blessed off, and now you're officially an astronaut, and you've never flown in space. You're not an astronaut till you fly in space. You're really not. And and uh, and so it is just, um, for, for me, I was exactly where I wanted to be at that point in time. There was a similar question that came in. Instead of at the time of launch, you've all done spacewalks you've been outside of the thing that took you there. There's nothing between you and the rest of the universe. What's the feeling of that? What can you see? Did you see, we did get the text question, did you see any aliens? We'll have to get that question out of the way. What can you see when you're doing a spacewalk in addition to the things you've been trained to do while you're there? Well, I always used to tell the astronauts that didn't do spacewalks that the view from inside here is pretty good. But when you have that full panoramic uh, helmet on, you know, and you, you, you're full from ear to ear, you know, you, your vision is just full of space, you know, looking down at the earth. I can remember floating there next to the space station, looking down between my feet, I see the earth, you know, passing underneath us. It's just uh, surreal, really, to think that you are, you're traveling 17,500 miles an hour in that, in that suit that's really a one-person spaceship and just watching the earth it's just phenomenal you know uh we kind of burn those images into our brains so we'll never forget some of those things but it's just incredible i'm just gonna use a sort of a something to compare with based on what mike said you know you you've you've been someplace on vacation maybe it's in the mountains uh, maybe it's a maybe it's at uh, at the ocean and you're in you're in a house or in a cabin and you're looking through a window and it's beautiful but then you go outside and not only it and now it's all around you and that's a little bit uh i i think that's part of the difference i mean you know i said until you fly in space you're really not an astronaut until you do a spacewalk you're really not a cool astronaut yet. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and i'm not going to say anything more i'm going to now, now the person who taught me how to how to be a spacewalker was Jerry over there, so I'm going to pass it on to him. Well, everybody always wants to know if I was scared when I went out the hatch the first time on the first spacewalk, and my answer to them was no, absolutely not. I had uh, been a support crew member for three crews who had done a total of six spacewalks on their missions, and I was in mission control talking to them when they were outside, and they were flying around on that little rocket backpack called the Man Maneuvering Unit, and having fun, and I was sitting down there on the ground having done all that work helping them get ready to go fly in space, 
and I was turning a little bit more green with envy every time that I had to talk to them. So literally when I got my first flight, uh, we had two planned spacewalks that we were going to do. And when I got onto orbit, I thought, okay, so uh, probably the space shuttle is going to have a problem and we're going to have to go home before I can get outside on that first spacewalk. Fortunately, that didn't happen. And then we checked out the spacesuits. I said, well, they're probably not going to check out, so I'm not going to be able to go outside. And fortunately, that didn't happen. We were able to go outside. And literally, when I got into my suit and we depressurized the airlock the first time and opened up that outside hatch, and I stuck my head out the hatch for the first time, and there's a full faceplate of Earth floating by down there below us, I literally wanted to let out this war hoop of, of glee, of happiness, of finally making it. And I thought that if I did that, everybody would think that Ross had finally lost it and told me to get back inside and close the hatch. So I didn't do that, but it was an incredible experience. And I, I felt uh, totally at home. I felt like I was uh, doing exactly what God had designed me to do, the training and all the hundreds of hours in spacesuits before I got a chance to fly in space all made it feel very natural. So you're a doom and gloom kind of guy. <laughs> Might, well, the shuttle might fail, the suit might fail. <laughs> a lot of fun. Yeah. STS-80. Um, oh. I miss the state, Mr. MacArthur, that you grew up in. I heard in the oh. Ohio, but I miss what you said. I'm sorry, I did North Carolina. I grew up on a tobacco and cotton farm in uh, southeastern North Carolina. What town? Uh, it's a little town called Red Springs. Uh, it's near Lumberton, Larnburg, Fayetteville. So for somebody who texted, where is his accent from? Did that question get answered? Okay, all right. So, so we are, I'm not making these up. They're so, really so, 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 it, you know, so I took my North Carolina accent, when, so I lived in North Carolina for a total of, uh, uh, total of 20 years. And then I've lived here for 32 years. And so, you know, <laughs> you know it's like, I'm, I'm, I, I've, I've got an accent and I'm proud of it. Now, I, I, I did a lot of Capcoming over the years, and and I and the crews would come back, and they 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 seemed to they they seemed to you know enjoy having talked to me on the radio, and I always decided it was that I talked so slow with such a so slowly with such a thick accent, they knew I couldn't be trying to deceive them. <laughs> this young man here has set a record tonight for the longest holding his hand up to ask a question. So he's next. What's your question? How does it feel in space? Gosh, uh, it feels cool. I mean, it is, it's just a great place to be. So, do you sit absolutely still when you're on those hard chairs in school? Or do you sometimes squirm around a little bit? Maybe a little bit? Well, in space, you, you can't sit in a chair because you have to have gravity to sit down. And the reason you squirm is because if you're just in in one place for a long period of time your bottom starts hurting a little bit so you want to shift around and so in space because you're always floating it's it's just it's it's very once you get used to it it's very comfortable and it's really neat to to think i want to go over to that bookcase and so you just push yourself off a little bit and you just glide over and if you live in space you get really good at doing that <laughs> Rub it in. You see that 100 on his uh, flight jacket right there? That means he spent over 100 days in space. Six months to be exact, and we were glad to have him gone, really. <laughs> I know that sound doesn't travel in space, so were there any problems hearing each other? And if there were, how did you overcome those? Okay, well you're correct, the sound does not travel in space because it ha you have to have some air for the, the sound waves to propagate. So in the vacuum of space there, there is no sound transmitted. But inside the crew compartment where we lived, or inside the space station, there is air. So it's just like here. We talked to each other, it was a little bit more noisy because of the air circulating and machinery and stuff, so uh, maybe we had to talk a little louder. Uh, if somebody was up on the flight deck and we were down in the lower floor, or the, what we call the mid-deck of the space shuttle, we might actually pick up a microphone and use the intercom to talk to the people upstairs uh, on a, a speaker. Uh, and if we were talking to the ground, then we use radios to talk to people on the ground. So it was all very easy and, and no problem at all. And then spacesuits, spacesuits. Yeah, inside the spacesuits, we also had communication systems. 
We had a, a thing we called a Snoopy cap, which held our ear uh, cups in the right, right places. And there's also a couple of uh, microphone booms that came out on the sides of the mouth that would pick up our voice and uh, be able to communicate uh, that way as well. What's the biggest uh, scientific contribution or discovery you made on a mission? <laughs> Whoa! There you go, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Six Months in Space. <laughs> so, so, um, there were only two of us on board a space station uh, on, uh, on my crew, that's right. Just myself and one other person for six months. Yes, we are good friends. Um, <laughs> and so we actually spent most of our time, um, uh, most of our time uh, uh, keeping the station running, uh, repairing things, uh, changing filters. Every Saturday morning we spent, I mean, wiping down the walls and cleaning things. So we didn't do as much, uh, as much scientific uh, scientific exper uh, experiments as I would have liked. My first mission though was uh, a, a what was called a Space Lab Life Sciences mission and it was a two-week shuttle mission. It was actually the first time the space shuttle flew a true 14 days. I mean it was you know actually uh, you know 14 24-hour days that we were up and uh, and so we did uh, a lot of research on ourselves uh, and we had uh, 48 rats on board uh, that we were um, uh, that we were studying and so um, you know, what we're trying to learn we were trying to learn things for example about how the absence of gravity affects your bones and so one of the things that we that we've learned from studying humans and animals in space is how important it how important exercise and uh, the, what uh, how important exercise is for maintaining strong bones I mean we say that uh, but but we've really come to the conclusion, for example, that lifting weights is about the best exercise you can do to, uh, to have strong bones. And we've also understood better uh, how diet can affect, uh, can affect uh, your skeletal system. Um, now they're up there, uh, gosh, uh, right now on board space station there's something called the alpha magnetic spectrometer. And, uh, you know, it's... Uh, um, uh, gosh, it's trying to detect things like antimatter. So there are there's just quite exotic research that's going on in space. Even though uh, Jerry and I were short duration astronauts, meaning we didn't go for six months, we went for 16 days, 11 days. In my case, we did participate in some experiments. On my first mission, I took part. I was a guinea pig for this sleep study experiment that NASA was running to try to figure out how well astronauts sleep. You slept all the time? I slept, well, that's when I worked for you. Um, <laughs> so uh, I put on this, this uh, sleep watch before I launched and kept it on the entire time I was in space except when I was doing spacewalks. And so uh, that, that thing had a light detector and a motion detector in it. And so it detect, if it detected light and motion, it recorded that I was awake. If it recorded no motion and darkness, it recorded that I was asleep. So it knew when I was awake, it knew when I was asleep, I called it my Santa Claus watch. Yeah. But I'm bummed. I got a bigger laugh in India when I told that thing. <laughs> okay. That's because they didn't understand. They didn't understand. So uh, anyway, I came back from space and the uh, chief scientist told me, she said, Mike, on your first night in space, you got three hours and 24 minutes of sleep. And I said, yes, that was definitely not enough. She said, the good news is after that, you started to average about five and a half hours of sleep. And, and um, that's about what I average, I think, throughout my the rest of my nights in space was about five and a half hours. It's just hard to sleep in space. Uh, no pillow, uh, no mattress, you know. My body tonight, when I lay down on the bed, you know, there's a mattress and a pillow, and that's a kind of a subtle, you know, cue to my brain. It's time to shut down and go to sleep. We didn't have that in space. You're just floating in a dark room in your sleeping bag, but uh, nothing behind you, nothing really. So. It was hard, I learned that it was hard to sleep in space. So I would ask Bill, after six months, did you start getting good at sleeping in space? Yes, yes I did. <laughs> um, it, it was- Still got rock burns on you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it, you know, it just, uh, uh, like, like many things, uh, you know, especially uh, experiences that have a lot of unusual physical stimulation, eventually you really become accustomed to them and uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I probably, I, 
I would think I probably averaged uh, six and a half, seven hours of sleep, and I, sl and I thought I slept well. But, but I, also had, uh, I also had the ability at about bedtime to call anywhere and make a telephone call to anywhere in the world. So the space station uh, has, uh, it, we had two channels uh, when I was there, that I think they have four now, uh, that they can make telephone calls via the internet. And uh, so generally about nine o'clock at night, uh, Greenwich Mean Time, which is when our uh, day ended, um, I would start making phone calls because it was about three o'clock back here. Uh, my wife I anno annoyed the ever-loving daylights out of her because uh, she's uh, she's uh, she was and still is a NASA employee, and so I invariably would uh, call her while she was in the middle of a meeting somewhere. Um, my daughters uh, would kind of get tired of talking to me, and they started doing this. Dad, <laughs> you're breaking up. <laughs> Call your sister. <laughs> but uh, but uh, but yeah, I, I and and it's just peace. And especially with only two people in uh, uh, in space station. Space station when I was there uh, wasn't wasn't nearly as big as it is now, but it had an interior volume about the same as a three bedroom house. And I slept at one. And and because uh, my uh, crewmate was Russian. He stayed in the Russian segment in case there were any problems at, at night. He would be right there with the Russian systems, and I slept in the U.S. Uh, the U.S. segment for for the same reasons because I had access to all the com all the computer interfaces uh, for the U.S. Uh, U.S. systems. But uh, but that meant it was I mean it was it was peaceful. I mean there were no other crew me crew, uh, crew members to bump into or disturb. So uh, it was a lot of fun. Let me just add on the experiment question. Uh, on my fourth flight, we uh, flew for 10 days. We had a 24-hour uh, work schedule, had two different shifts of people working, and we conducted 88 different experiments during those 10 days. And one of the experiments I thought was really neat, there'd been a theory for years and years that could not be demonstrated and proved uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt here on the ground that materials can exist at what is called the triple point where they are in a solid, a liquid, and a gaseous state all simultaneously under certain uh, pressures and temperatures. And we did that. We demonstrated that uh, conclusively. And the only reason that we could do that is because we're in zero gravity. Because here on the ground, gravity causes uh, density and temperature changes to cause things to mix, and you cannot ever get to the equilibrium where you can demonstrate a triple point uh, satisfactorily. But in zero gravity, we were able to do that. And I thought that was pretty cool to demonstrate a theory that had been there for years but had never been in, been verified. Okay, our next question comes from the best dressed member of the audience. Tyler. I, I had a question about your readjustment back on Earth. Um, what was it like the first time you got out of your chair after being in zero gravity? Well, I'll answer it from a, a short duration uh, perspective and then we can listen to Bill talk about how you both the bowl of jelly he was when he got back from six months in space but I remember uh, both missions coming back uh, first mission I was a flight engineer on the shuttle so I sat between the commander and the pilot I had a very good view of all the instruments one of the instruments I could see was our accelerometer our G meter and I remember during re-entry you know we're all suited up we got our space suit on for re-entry and my helmet felt like it weighed about 100 pounds. And I looked at that G-meter, we were pulling about 1.6 Gs. You know, if you, if you strain yourself in your chair, you can get to 1.6 Gs right here in this room. But, you know, that's not a lot of G-force. But uh, when you're not used to gravity, when you've been away from it for 16 days, uh, gravity is a real eye-opener, you know, and it's not fun. We always had a, had a phrase that we said, uh, gravity is not good. <laughs> Something like that. Something like that. Yes. Um, so... You come back and, and you get on the runway, you know, and the shuttle stops and gosh, you feel like, wow, I feel so heavy. I don't know if I can even stand up, but your legs still work. You can stand up. It just feels, that feeling where it wears off in about, I'd say 45 minutes or an hour. I felt back like, you know, I was used to the gravity again, walking around was, was normal, but my sense of balance was off for about two and a half days after the first mission. And, that's because your neurovestibular system, and, and I'm an engineer, okay, so I'm gonna explain this like an engineer would, and I apologize to the doctors, but <laughs> neurovestibular system in your inner ear is what gives you, helps your sense of balance, okay? There's a little uh, uh, sensor in there that detects gravity, and it tells your brain where down is. You know, in, in relation to down, you can kind of figure out where the rest of the 
you know the world is so um, come back from space and while you're weightless there's no stimulus for that sensor so there's no signal being sent to the brain from the neurovestibular system so it kind of goes to sleep it sort of shuts down and you come back and now you get back to gravity and that sensor is sort of waking up a little bit and it's trying to figure out how to send that signal to your brain and i remember walking around when i first got back and you feel like uh well uh, my balance is okay our flight surgeons meet us at the bottom of the stairs you know to the shuttle and ask us to do that sobriety check which bill's used to but uh, the rest of us you know i mean that's a tricky west point guy that uh so you pass the test but you still feel like your sense of balance is off for for me for two and a half days after that first mission it felt like i was about 85 percent of my my balance was there and then woke up two and a half days after landing and my balance was back to 100 percent went back to space a year and a half later all the same experiences coming back you know i felt very heavy for 45 minutes and my sense of balance was off but uh, a day later 24 hours later and the second time around my sense of balance came back to 100 percent it was sort of like you know our human bodies are so adaptable you know we send them to space and we get used to weightlessness and we live there and we come back and we readapt pretty quickly and it's pretty amazing you know the adaptability of the human body so um that's that's the kind of feelings that you go through long duration guy yeah long duration guy um and, and so the I, I think the biggest difference the biggest difference if you're if you're up for months instead of weeks is that it just takes a little bit longer for your body to readjust now the Russians are pretty uh, they're uh, they're pretty experienced about how to recover crew members after long duration flights um, and they don't once they get you out of the caps it, very often the capsule will lay on its side and so they just put the hatches in the top and so they just put they just pull you out sideways uh, we landed about an hour before sunrise, calm winds, um, the ground was was damp and soft, and so we hit and just stayed upright. And so now they have to put a little scaffold over it, and you really don't have the strength to climb out on yourself uh, by yourself, so you stand up in the center seat, they pull you up, and they, they lower you down a little slide, and then physically carry you to a chair. They don't even allow you to attempt to stand up, let alone walk, and it's a good thing because your neurovestibular system is way out of out of whack. Um, then they carry you in the chair to a medical tent. Um, we're out in the steppes of Kazakhstan. I mean, it's you know it looks like West Texas, but anyhow. <clears throat> um, and then uh, and then after after a little while, the doctors will, will, will your doctors help you stand up. They get you out of the suit. Have you lay down again? Uh, take your vital signs, get you up, and let and, and let you walk a little bit. And they want you to start walking quickly, but uh, <clears throat> initially uh, that you've got uh, you you've got a doctor on each arm because they're just not going to let you try to uh, to uh, to stand or walk on your own. Uh, uh, get back uh, get back to Moscow, and uh, uh, I was I was fortunate. Uh, my wife, uh, and daughters, and son-in-law were there, and so. Uh, because my wife was there and and she could stay with me at night I didn't have to have my doctor stay with me at night <laughs> uh, but but she was under pretty uh, you know she, she she was very careful not to let me you know walk anywhere without uh, without her support and uh, and I think for a few days it, it was a few days before they would even let me look at a, a set of stairs and then I did a lot of uh, a lot of post-flight testing trying to, to determine how my uh, neurovestibular system had recovered uh, and after about 10 days, they, they said I pr it would probably be safe for me to drive, but I would need to be careful if I was on a big clover leaf that you could have a sort of flashback and you, would, uh, you could have vertigo. So that's why when I got back here, my wife wouldn't let me drive for a month. <laughs> what were the items you could take into space personally, and what were the items you missed from Earth while you were in space that you craved as soon as you got back to gravity? Hmm. Seven flights worth of stuff. <laughs> okay, so there were basically three different categories of things that NASA allowed us to carry into space. One was 10 items, which was the official uh, flight kit, which was uh, like school banners or things that, w that represented different organizations that had helped you get to where you got to be. 
and uh, then after the flight you would uh, mount those and take them back and present them to the organization from which they came or what they represented. Uh, there's another category of 20 personal preference kit items that we could fly on the space shuttle and they were little things like uh, medallions, necklaces, rings, things like that. And you could fly one per person up to uh, 17 people and you could fly three that were un undesignated that you could decide later like a grandkid that was going to be born later or something like that. Um, and they were, those were all stowed somewhere where you couldn't get access to them during the flight, below the floorboard somewhere. Then we also had another uh, one that I helped to put on, uh, for, on board for the crews for the last uh, 10 years of the shuttle flying that was uh, uh, school banners. It was, I think, three or four items that each person could fly that were school banners, pictures of their family, things like that. Uh, I flew my Bible on my last flight. Uh, first, we weren't allowed to, to fly books because they thought we'd take the book home and rip out a page and give it to each person around or something <laughs> like that. So, But uh, that was basically it. As far as what I, I missed, uh, I think I missed uh, family. I, I missed fresh air, even though the air in the vehicle was fine. And uh, I always enjoyed coming home and getting a good uh, Mexican meal with, uh, with a margarita. <laughs> yeah, the special, what do we call that? Special PPK? Special? Special. Special, uh, special flight. Special flight data file. Special flight special, data file. Special FDF. Uh, were those things that were in a locker, you could actually get access to them. And uh, on STS-129, my crewmates and I were approached and said, would you guys uh, fly the, uh, the coin toss coin for the Super Bowl, 2010 Super Bowl? And we said, well, of course we would. You know, that'd be, that'd be really <laughs> as cool. As long as you invite us. As long as you invite us, yeah. We, I guess we didn't say that because it ended up they didn't invite us. But anyway. It was implied. It might have been <laughs> my crewmates. I blame those guys. So um, one of the things we took, because this coin actually belonged to the uh, National Football League Hall of Fame. And so we took a football that was signed by all the Hall of Fame oh, wow. people, you know, all the, and it wasn't personally signed. It was one that you could buy at the, at the Hall of Fame in Canton. You know, it's got all their autographs sort of printed on there. But they wouldn't let us take a pump, you know, when we couldn't fly it inflated. <laughs> so we have this deflated football. They actually did, Jerry did let us take a football needle, you know, so if we'd had a pump, we could have blown it up with a pump, but we took that to space, and Butch Wilmore, the pilot on STS-129, he got that thing out, and he blew it up himself with that needle. <laughs> Can you imagine blowing up a football? This is, you know, Butch Wilmore. Full of hot air. <laughs> Full of hot air, yeah. exactly. So we had that football, we, we played a little football up there while we were up there, and then we uh, presented that football and the coin back to the Hall of Fame when we got back, and then they loaned it out to the game, and since then, uh, an aside, uh, my high school, which is about 15 minutes from Canton, Ohio, asked me to come and, and toss a coin for a football game last fall. And I said, okay, I got just the coin. So I called the Hall of Fame and I said, can I borrow that coin that uh, we took to space, you know, uh, for, the, for the football, for the Super Bowl? And they said, yeah, sure, we'll send a guy over, you know, and he'll stand there with it until you're done with it. And then he'll, he'll bring it back to Canton. So, you know, I'm a very trusting looking person, I guess. So. Anyway, he, I said, can you come early enough? I want to do a little pep talk to the team there. And I went in the locker room with that coin and told him, you know, the whole thing and how I had gotten to be an astronaut and how I had gotten to float. And at the end, I said, so what's cooler? That this coin has been used at a Super Bowl or, and these are high school football players, or that it's been in space. And all those guys said, been in space, that's so cool. <laughs> Did they win? So uh, I always uh, always enjoyed hearing uh, shuttle crew members answer the question about what food do you miss? <laughs> Two week mission. <laughs> so yeah, I, I'm I'm gonna quit. I'm I'm gonna quit being so obnoxious about that, <laughs> but not tonight. Um, so so uh, so, but uh, and, and you know there are you you, you do miss. Uh, you know, as, as I mentioned, it, it helped the, the isolation from family was helped by being able to, to uh, call my family, uh, make telephone calls. We had a video, one video conference a week. Um, we got, I got extra uh, with the family, I got extra video conferences uh, over the 
uh, uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays. And so um, I, d I didn't have that quite the same sense of, you know, they, they really did a good job mitigating that sense of isolation you have uh, away from your family. Um, you know, Jerry mentioned uh, like the weather. Uh, I, I like to say that the real world has texture. Um, mm -hmm. In the space station, the temperature never changed. Uh, it was generally about uh, 78 degrees in the Russian section and about 72 degrees in the U.S. section. Um, it always smelled the same. Um, you know, there were, there were no wind, uh, no rain showers. I got back the first summer and I just was thrilled walking through this, you know, walking through the parking lot at the Space Center sweltering in the 100 degree heat. You know, it's like, I don't miss that so much anymore. Um, but from a, you know, from a food standpoint, I, I, I missed food that was crunchy. You know, our food is just soft. Uh, if it's a, if our, our vegetables uh, in space all tend to be uh, freeze dried so you rehydrate them and they're mushy. Um, uh, coffee that I could smell. Uh, we drink things out of a bag, so you can't smell. You know, yeah. Golly, j just imagine how much you you enjoy your morning coffee because you can smell it, and a carbonated beverage, a Coca Cola, and uh, so by some hook or crook, uh, the uh, the the docs when they met me on the ground, they uh, they didn't have any uh, celery for me to crunch on, but I did have uh, I did have a Starbucks coffee in the middle of Kazakhstan. And, uh, and a Coca-Cola. And then uh, the, there was actually a th third crewmate that went up with us, a, uh, a, a, a businessman from New Jersey, and uh, uh, he has a, uh, he's got, a, uh, he's got a, uh, a farm in South Africa and produces wine, and so uh, Greg was actually there, and so we did have a little bit of his red wine. Yeah. We've got a question here. If all of you guys have been training at all times, how are certain ones of y'all are picked for these flights? And the second question would be, what type of training did ones continuously do? And I think Mike, you said you in five years before you got the show. What type of training do you continuously do for five years? Well, we just keep trying to get better at what they train us to do initially, you know, and we do spacewalk training. And some of that training, you know, you need to keep doing it uh, over and over again to stay proficient at it doing the spacewalk training in the pool that we train in up the road there. You know, that's one of those things that you need to do it uh, fairly often so that, you, you know, you, you don't lose that skill that you've, they've trained you to, to have to be a spacewalker. And then uh, we were always uh, flying the airplanes. You know, we stayed uh, current in flying the airplanes, flying the jets, and we didn't want to lose that our flying skills, you know, that we had before we even got here. And so. Just a lot of training now. You know, after you're an astronaut candidate, which we abbreviated ASCAN uh, because NASA has a lot of acronyms. So the the nick, you know, the acronym for astronaut candidate is ASCAN. Well, after you're ASCAN and you graduate, you get a ground job. That's when I was telling you about working for Jerry. At one point, one of my ground jobs was working for Jerry in his in his branch. And uh, so you also have job. You know, eight to five job that you're doing technical assignment. So you're keeping up with that. The trainers are putting you in the simulators and you're doing simulated training and you're flying airplanes and you, it's a it's a pretty busy life and then you're sending you off to a library in Ohio to, to tell people about what an astronaut's all about you know and a couple of times a month maybe go off and do that so it's a bit, pretty busy life but yeah we we do a lot of training you know some astronauts I think they leave NASA just because they're so tired of all the training <laughs> so the other question I had was how do you get selected for a flight I was the acting deputy chief of the astronaut office for about a year and a half or so, so um, I, I have some maybe a little clear insight into that. I'm interested uh, to hear this. Yeah. <laughs> but basically, uh, the chief of the astronaut office uh, during my uh, era there would uh, look at not just the next flight, but maybe the next four or five or six flights that were coming up. And he would look at the different requirements of each of the missions, what kinds of uh, technical background or expertise might be useful on that flight. He would look at uh, the rotation of all of the commanders that had already flown and ones that are getting close to the top of the list for another assignment. Likewise for the flown pilots and unflown pilots. And he would look at where it would be good to, to slip in an unflown pilot or rookie pilot in to, with a, a good uh, companion commander. Likewise for the mission specialists like all three of us were, 
uh, they would look again at uh, who was going to be a good candidate to be the flight engineer as Mike and I think Bill you flew as a flight engineer all three of us flew as a flight engineer at one time or another which that was a guy that helped the commander and the pilot to get get the vehicle into orbit and back home and then also uh, the other cadre of mission specialists that would be the ones that might be operating the robotic arm or conducting the spacewalks or they might have a special uh, uh, expertise and training and background in some of the experiments that we're going to be conducting on a flight. And again, they would look, uh, the, the head of the astronaut office would look at that five or six flights, look at who was rotating up on uh, ready for a reassignment after they had flown before, as well as who were the candidates who had not yet flown, and kind of try to salt that in there so that you had a good mix of veterans and rookies going on a flight. And uh, I have to tell you, though, that one of the things that uh, might be a little bit surprising was that uh, personalities was not something that was very heavily considered in the mix. You might think that that would be, if I was doing it, I think I would have tried to look a little bit more strongly at the personalities and try to make <laughs> compatible crewmates, but uh, that wasn't always the case. And, and, and so uh, the crews had to work through some issues once in a while when they had somebody that was not quite as compatible with some others. So how many missions had you flown when you were assigned as the deputy chief of the astronaut office? Five. Five. So that's when you said, hey, here'd be a good place for my sixth mission, here'd be a good place for my seventh mission. Yeah. In fact, I started penciling myself in on some of these lists. And finally, I figured out I was supposed to use ink instead of pencil, so. Oh, okay, that's right. We have a question over here on your left. Do you believe we're alone? <laughs> well, that's a tough question. So, universe is pretty big. Um, there are billions of galaxies, and galaxies have at least millions of stars, and so there must be millions upon billions of planets. And there are, and we know there are planets in what's called the Goldilocks zone. You know, the Earth is in the Goldilocks zone around our star. That means we're the, the right distance away from the sun, so it's not too hot and it's not too cold. And that's part of the reason why life, as we, know, as we understand life, was able to develop on this planet. So just odds are that there, there are other planets in the universe on which life as we know it could have developed. But then there are other planets on which life that we, uh, of a form we can't quite imagine perhaps could have developed. So, uh, so just statistically, I suspect there is life elsewhere. Now, but what I'm also convinced is it has never visited this planet. Um, inter the, inter the, the, the technology required to travel those distances is something we can't even conceive. There is no warp factor nine, Mr. Sulu. So um, hopefully someday there will be. Um, and, and somebody's talking about the movie from, uh, was it from the Earth to the Moon? Um, and, you know, we, we talk about science fiction. Well, what's science fiction? Science fiction are things that people imagine that have some relation to the physical sciences. Um, and it's really ironic. I mean, uh, gosh, H.G. Uh, uh, Wells, uh, The Time Machine. H.G. Uh, Wells, uh, The First Man on the Moon, I think was the name of one of his books. Uh, um, uh, and so, uh, it, you know, and so, uh, and Jules, Jules Verne uh, imagined uh, uh, sub, you know, submarines with some type of you know, uh, un, almost unlimited power in there. And, and of course, Walt Disney in his, uh, in, his uh, uh, in the Disney uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea sort of suggested that was nuclear energy. But the, I, but the point is, if human beings can imagine it, then historically human beings have eventually done it um, so I, I, I think maybe it might not be my lifetime but it might be his okay question for over here whenever you were in space what was your favorite space food M&M's <laughs> malted milk balls M&M's with Peanuts. <laughs> but but they're great space food because you can play with them. Um, 
you know, so, so Jerry and I flew together in 1995. Uh, that's when he taught me how to do spacewalks, although we didn't get to do one on that mission, we were ready. Uh, but, but we'd you know, like get on the mid deck and you take either, you know, for him, you take malted milk balls and he'd be at one side of the milk deck, uh, 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 the mid deck, he'd open his mouth and I would just try to float it across very slowly. And... It, was, it was feeding time at the zoo. <laughs> so now we know what you do in your spare time in space. Yeah. Well, we're supposed to be sleeping. Do you play games in space? Ah. Well, uh, my crewmates uh, had that football, and they, they actually played a little football. You know, one of my crewmates, uh, Leland Melvin, he was a pro football player before he was an astronaut. And Butch Wilmore, the guy that blew up the football, he was a college football star in Tennessee, and we had that football on board. And, you know, I found out that while we were up there, they had a little football game you know where I found out was when we were putting together our crew movie and they showed me the draft of the crew movie and here's a scene where these guys are playing football and I said, hey, where was I? And they said, well, Mike, you were busy getting the spacesuits ready for the next spacewalk. We didn't want to bother you, so we didn't invite you to the game. You know, it's just like third grade all over again. You know? <laughs> Jeez. But anyway, uh, they had a little football, so they played a little football game up there. And, Butch put a pretty hard hit on Leland Melvin, so I think he's glad that he wasn't playing pro football anymore. Uh, besides Earth, what is the coolest and or your favorite planet and why? Besides the Earth. Huh. Ohio. Tough one, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I think none of us have been anywhere but Earth as far as planets or celestial bodies, so it's kind of hard to say. We, we all look forward to the day when we both go back to the moon and then eventually get to Mars. So um, those will be cool. You know, we're, we'll be in the rocking chair, you know, watching those guys go, but, uh, and gals, guys and gals go, but uh, I, I don't know. I guess uh, if we had to pick one, maybe we say Mars because that's our next planetary destination. Jeff, this lady's had her hand up as long as that kid. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, um, for Mr. Arthur, uh, MacArthur, Hmm. Um, first of all, uh, what was, what do you do on your spare time for so many months? Um, how different was your ride home on a Russian spa spacecraft versus an American? And also, were all of the exper uh, experiments uh, related to just civilian type things or were there military things going on also? While you're up in space. Okay, so on the on the space station, I used to uh, uh, the space shuttle. Your time is very uh, is completely subscribed. Uh, they really uh, keep a crew uh, working on a very detailed schedule. I think on a on a like a 14 day mission, you'd get about two half days off. Off. Um, and now space, sta the space station, they, they recognize that we couldn't run a schedule that intense uh, for such a long duration. And so generally, I had a uh, five and a half day work week. And so um, ostensibly, we had Saturday afternoon off and Sunday off until dinner time. And then uh, at dinner time, we would begin planning, uh, would begin discussing the next day's activities uh, with the ground. And so uh, what we really had was we had a lot of discretion about um, w we could move things around on the schedule unless it was an activity that required ground involvement. And so that gave us a little bit of flexibility to do things like, ooh, I'm getting ready to have a pass over southeast Texas. I'm going to stop what I'm doing, go to the window and take pictures. Um, Saturday afternoon, and, and what I generally, I, I generally called my f uh, free time, it was the time in which I got to d decide what work I was going to do, because I had a task list, and I, the items on the task list weren't scheduled, but I knew two to four weeks in the future they would be on the schedule, and so, uh, um, and so that really describes the, the, uh, the work day a little bit, if you will. So, but there, there was there was free time, and uh, and so on the free time, uh, I would uh, look out the window, take pictures of the ground. Um, 
I talked on an, on the we had a couple of amateur radio transmitters on a couple of amateur radio stations on board, and so I would uh, talk to just people on the ground. And it, this was line of sight radio, so uh, you know how you can you see see the little things that says, see the space station, and you go out and you see the space station passing overhead. If you had a radio, the as long as you could see the space station, you would be able to talk directly. Uh, yeah, to, a, to a crew member if he or she was on the radio station uh, or was on the, uh, uh, the radio equipment on, on board. Um, and then uh, I, I, in addition to my family, I took up my entire contact list. And so I had high school teachers, family members, uh, professional colleagues, um, uh, uh, college professors, and so I had a list of people I wanted to call from space. And what's, what's ironic, I'll run into those folks and they'll go, do you remember when you called me? Oh yes, I do. I remember exactly when I called you. <laughs> and uh, so. Uh, Did anybody think it was a, a, a crank phone call? Um, no, it, you know, it, it, you know, that's the, that's the benefit of having my accent. It's, you know, it's kind of hard for somebody. Now I did, uh, my brother, uh, my brother, uh, is a retired Marine and it, and it, uh, when I flew, he was working for IBM in, uh, in the, in uh, North Carolina. And so I called him pretty early on and I'd never told him I had the ability to make phone calls. And so he answers his phone and I, and I say, Hey brothers, <laughs> you know, what, what, where, where are you? And he goes, no, I said, hey brother, what are you doing? And he goes, where are you? <laughs> I'm not next door, that's for sure. So you all spent time in space, you all did space walks. How did that change your faith, your spiritual side, by doing this experience? That's a good question. First, I got to ask Bill, did you experience any Army Navy football games while you're up there? I did. What was the outcome of that? Game? It was pitiful. <laughs> so, and, and so sadly, they uplinked the video to me. I don't know, it was like 51 to nothing, or it was just some ghastly, uh, ghastly score. And, uh, and it, was, it was funny. I volunteered uh, to uh, repair a piece of. Uh, um, atmospheric test equipment that we had on board and so uh, eventually I just shut the game off and kept doing the work. <laughs> so if you're an army fan you have to have a lot of faith. <laughs> I did and it's starting to pay dividends. <laughs> well I, I think for me flying in space just uh, reinforced my, my Christian beliefs. Uh, looking down at the earth going around it every 90 minutes seeing the fragility of the blue band that is our atmosphere around the earth uh, reinforces uh, the creation that we have here to enjoy and the fact that we need to be good stewards to protect it for uh, the environment for future generations uh, but I, I really likened it uh, to a, a God's eye perspective on the world and you will go around the world you don't see borders between countries you see the beauty of the creation you know that there are people down there suffering and there are, you know, there's wars going on and things like that, but you, you don't see that. You understand it, but you don't see it. And it's, it's an incredible uh, place to be. And I have to tell you, in my book, I talk about on my uh, third space shuttle flight, on my second spacewalk on that flight, I was out uh, at night. I was being held high above the payload bay on the end of the robotic arm. And uh, the guys inside said, take a break, we got to concentrate on the other spacewalker buddy that was out there with me. So I turned off my helmet mounted lights and I just kind of leaned back and I was looking at the, the expanse of the universe out there as my eyes adapted to the dark, total darkness. And all of a sudden I had this feeling come over me uh, that I was at unity with the universe. And that I was doing exactly what God had intended me to do. And that's what I talk about in my book, is the fact that I, I feel that why did a six-year-old kid in northwest Indiana, before satellites had ever launched into space, get that attachment or that excitement about getting involved in a country space program and having the boneheaded uh, determination to not give up no matter what happened along the way. And uh, I, I really feel very blessed that I got a chance to, to do that, to serve our country in such an incredible way. And uh, to have that reassurance while I was outside on a spacewalk was just incredible experience. 
Well, it's a tough act to follow, Jerry, but uh, I will say uh, I definitely had the same types of feelings. Uh, uh, seeing the world from that vantage point just strengthened the fact, my belief, that there's a higher power, and, uh, you know, it's just incredible. So I want to kind of relate that to the earlier question about, uh, you know, kind of are we alone out there? Um, and, and I sort of approached it from a very analytical, you know, let's look at, you know, let's look at big numbers and talk about probabilities and things like that. And um, what you do see, as Jerry pointed out and, and Mike uh, seconded, um, when you see, you know, you, you can look outside now and, you know, Friendswood's a pretty little town. I mean, it really, I'm sorry, it's a little, I'm sorry I said it's a little, it's, it's a beautiful metropolis. But, but it's huge. It, but, but, you know, and, and, and you, I mean, you see beautiful trees outside and, and uh, you know, we, we really enjoy uh, being here. But we kind of, we, we, we still are seeing a snapshot of, you know, our, our personal universe tends to be, um, not much outside arm's reach and there is actually a, a phenomena uh, I think the author is Frank White uh, wrote a book called The Overview Effect and it, uh, it sort of uh, discusses uh, the, the same idea that when you get a little, little bit further away from the earth and you can see a, the, a broader picture it's hard not uh, to be to be really moved uh, at very much a, a, on, a, on a spiritual level when you look at it and say and and look and say the world in which we live is not an accident. It it, it, it you know it just it is too complex and it work and it and it's just just elegant in the way the the way the universe works. Uh, you know, the the more the more I st studied science, uh, the more I believed that these th that that what we experience is not accidental. There must be a divine creator to to get all these these myriad these these in, these infinite number of little pieces all working together to do the right thing, and so. One of the things I used to like to do is go take a leaf. I mean, it could be off a tree, it could be a blade of grass, uh, and look at it, and especially like get a magnifying glass and look at it a little bit more closely, or look at it under a microscope. It is complex. You know, we do it. We can we can make pretty complex machines. I'm not. I don't know that we as human beings can duplicate a leaf. We can plant a tree, and God will make the tree grow and it will have leaves, but I don't know how we can make a leaf. So it's, uh, uh, oh, I would like to add one thing. You know, when you look at uh, the, the picture of the Earth uh, taken by, from, by the Apollo astronauts on the way, that's not what we see from space because we're only 250 miles up. If you look straight down, you, you see lots of dirt or water or forests or whatever. Now you look at the horizon and you can see the curvature of the earth but we don't see a globe. So the earth really is round from your experience? <laughs> <laughs> a question over here on the left please gentlemen. Author of you were obviously very qualified the first time you applied to the astronaut program. Okay. Did NASA ever share with you and everybody else when they don't get selected, what criteria are they looking for, or you know, what does it take? I mean, because like seven times, six times, I mean, that's, that's rough. And I commend you for sticking with it. I think, I think Jerry was only twice, right? Yeah. <laughs> they told Jerry. Uh, they didn't tell Bill and I. No, uh, I, I think it, it was... Uh, tough to pull information out of them but uh, you know by the time I was applying six seven eight eighth time I had friends that had been selected you know and uh, so I was able to talk to people that were actually on the inside and and get a little more uh, sort of a, sort of a look into you know what the astronaut office and what the people in it are are all about and what are they made up of but you know even after I got here you know it was tough to to uh, feel like you weren't living amongst a bunch of supermen, you know, and women, and, and 
it's a little bit uh, humbling, definitely, when you first get here. And I'm really glad I wasn't competing with some of the more recent classes. I mean, there's some, there's some impressive uh, young men and women in those groups. But general, so so for, for me personally, the first couple of times I applied, I knew I wasn't qualified. I mean, I, the, the, on paper, the minimum qualifications are pretty minimal. Uh, I mean, they really are. And, and so uh, no one gets selected who meets just the minimum qualifications. And so if you apply and you just meet the minimum qualifications, you, you, you sort of, you just, you, you know you're not, you know you're not going to, um, you know you're not going to get selected. I, um, the first time I applied, uh, one of, uh, I think I told my wife uh, the reason I applied is so that one day I could tell my grandchildren, you know, I applied to be an astronaut. <laughs> um, and, uh, but, but also what I found was once you have gotten engaged with the process, and, and you're right, no, they don't tell you why you weren't selected. Um, uh, now, if you're, if you're medically disqualified, that you'd, you'd find that out. But if you're just not selected because uh, they decided that you weren't going to be one of the 44 or 23 or how many were in your class? 19. 19. Ooh. Um, <laughs> so uh, the class before his had 35 in it. Um, but, and, and, but, you know, and so, and so you, you may not know why they selected someone over you, but you still can look at the uh, biographies of the people that were selected. And that's what I did over the years. It's like I didn't get selected. Let's see who was selected. And are there, are there any, you know, do, do, I, do I see a pattern here? Or is there something uh, that that I ought to consider aspiring to do to become more competitive and uh, things like that. <laughs> George. I, I did. I selected it. <laughs> um, and so there is a there is a there is a selection panel. Um, it will normally be chaired uh, by uh, by a senior government executive. Um, when, when I was selected, uh, it, it, at that time, the director of flight crew operations would chair uh, the panel. Um, and then there, it would be... Yeah, it was Don Putty when I got, got, got selected. Um, and so, um, uh, so George Abbey was the chair at the time. I wasn't, got, I wasn't selected, but was invited uh, down here to work. And then, uh, and then uh, uh, Don Putty replaced him in, in that job, and so he chaired the, the panel. And then the, the selection board, the selection panel, will have other astronauts on it. It will generally, it'll have medical, somebody from the medical community on it. Uh, very often they'll bring someone from other NASA, people from other NASA centers, just so they get a more, a broader uh, perspective. Uh, there's somebody from uh, human uh, human resources to make sure you're doing all the right, you know, following all the right rules. Generally, there's somebody from uh, uh, the uh, equal uh, employment uh, 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 equal employment opportunity office, um, uh, things like that. And so it it's a, it's a very rigorous uh, very rigorous process, and they really try to make it as fair as possible. You go through psychological. Uh, yes. Apparently uh, not. The <laughs> question, question was, do we go through psychological testing? Psychological testing, and the answer is, early on, it was very minimal. It's more so now as we're hiring people for longer and longer duration flights. Let me just give you a little bit more insight into the selection boards. I was on the board that selected bills. So you can blame me. <laughs> but uh, there's there's quite a few experienced astronauts, both uh, pilots and uh, mission specialists on those boards. And I went into it trying to hire the very best people that I could hire. And we would normally bring in about 20 people per week, week and we'd do maybe six, eight weeks of interviewing. And uh, in the first week, I already had about seven or eight people that I wanted to hire. And I figured that that wasn't going to work. And uh, you know, we just couldn't hire that many people. So the way I turned it around was I started looking at, I mean, almost anybody that's interviewed is technically capable of doing the job. No doubt about it. It's a buyer's market. I mean, NASA has got this ton of people that want to be selected, and I think this last time was 18,500 18, people that applied, and they selected 12. 12. So, I mean, it's a buyer's market, there's no doubt about it. I mean, that's, that's by far the most ever. But, um, so I started looking at, okay, what, the way I decided I was going to hire people is what motivates this person, 
so, because everybody can do the job technically. What motivates this person? And would I want to fly with this person or would I want my friends to be flying with this person? And that's the way I kind of took it from then on. And I think that was the better way to do it because that's what we, the selection board, that's the part that we could filter out as opposed to everything else that came from paperwork and everything else and medicals and everything else. We are almost out of time. We've had a lot of text questions dealing with personal hygiene. I've screened all of them out except this one. How do you go to the bathroom do space? brush your teeth in space? We do brush our teeth in space. Uh, I brushed my teeth this morning too. Um, <laughs> you know, I remember uh, before my first space flight and people say, well, what do you get to take to space? And the answer is basically nothing. You, you show up for a space flight, NASA gives you everything you need. Now, uh, several months before we went to space, we went to a, a, a warehouse over in Clear Lake somewhere where they have every brand of toothpaste, every brand of toothbrush, razors, everything that you'll ever need as a hygiene product. And they say, Mike, which ones of these do you want? And I say, well, I like this kind of toothpaste and, and I'll take this kind of toothbrush. And uh, whatever the, scene, the, the more experienced astronaut that was with us said, you might want more than one toothbrush. And I said, I'm going for 16 days. You know, a toothbrush down here lasts me for about 16 years. So um, <laughs> I, I can't imagine needing more than one. And they said, well, yeah, but remember, in space, you don't have running water that you're going to rinse your toothbrush off ever after each use. So, you know, that second day when you pick up that toothbrush and you see little crumbs of food stuck in the bristles, you might not want to put it back in your mouth. So, so I took, I think, a one for every other day. I took about eight toothbrushes, you know, and, and I probably still only used about one or two. But anyway, um, yes, we, we do, and we, we do brush our teeth in space. And, and it's just, and we do it exactly, the, the only difference is, is we don't have running water. You know, otherwise, you put a little toothbrush, toothpaste on your toothbrush, brush your teeth. Now, if you ever read the, car, you know, the carton that the toothpaste comes in, it says something about do not swallow. But you can swallow it for 16 days and you'll probably be okay. <laughs> or just spit it out into a washcloth and, and you throw the wash, you, you throw the, and on space station, all of those things, all your towels, washcloths, dirty clothes, they all get thrown away. Uh, they, they are put into a resupply ship. And when the resupply ship uh, re, uh, comes back through the Earth's atmosphere, it burns up. This young lady here wanted to know what was the scariest time in space? And no one wants to answer. Well, for me, the scariest time in space is the first eight and a half minutes of the flight. I've told people for years that eight and a half minutes it takes you to get into orbit is the shortest and longest eight and a half minutes of your life. It seems like it takes forever to get up there because you're, you want to get there and be safe, and yet it goes by so quickly that you can hardly remember that you did it. So it, that first eight and a half minutes is a very exciting ride. You literally feel like you're hanging on and that's basically what you're doing because the, the shuttle operated automatically, the computers did basically everything for you. And so you were just there monitoring the systems and doing what you've been trained to do, but you hope that you didn't have to in any way interact or do anything that wasn't the normal way of doing business. Yeah, I felt very uh, confident in my two space shuttle launches. I felt like everything was gonna be fine. I, I didn't have a worry, um, but I will, uh, kind of go against something Jerry said because my very first spacewalk I was a little anxious about that because you know until you go out there for the very first time and you're floating in your own spaceship spacesuit you know tethered to the space station but floating next to it um, you don't know exactly how you're gonna feel you know how you feel in that pool that we've spent you know hundreds and hundreds of hours in training but you know in the pool you're just basically scuba diving and you're looking at the bottom of a pool and nothing really bad can happen to you you know uh, in the pool Whereas in space, astronauts had come back and said, whoa, that spacewalk is a little scary because I felt like I was falling, which you literally are falling because you're in this orbit, you're essentially falling around. And that would be an uncomfortable feeling if you felt like you were falling for six and a half or seven hours. You know, we do tasks during our spacewalks that require both hands. So you cannot literally be hanging on with one hand while you're trying to manipulate tools and do all your work with your other hand. So you have to get comfortable floating next to the space station and doing things. So that I, I remember a couple days prior to my very first spacewalk thinking, ooh, you know, I hope this is good. But that I got out there and within a minute, I felt very comfortable. 
the, the training that NASA gave us, and I thought the spacewalk training was the best training I got as an astronaut. And they gave us a lot of training, but that was the most applicable and the best quality training I think that we had was our spacewalk training. And it kicked in, and, and I felt very comfortable, and, and I was just, you know, glad to be out there. The handrail that I reached for when I stepped out of the airlock was right where I expected it to be. The second one was right where I expected it to be. It was like they had built that space station to be identical to the one in the pool. <laughs> really, really it's amazing. Yeah. So, you know, it's, you know, is there a difference Did between being scared and being excited? I'm not, not so sure. sure. There's a, there are a lot of exciting things in spaceflight. The eight and a half minutes to get on orbit. Um, going uh, opening the hatch and seeing the earth uh, flowing uh, beneath you and then suddenly diving out head first um, those are all exciting things uh, I, and so I, I, I didn't and so they didn't so my sense wasn't being frightened but what but what can be frightening is when you're thinking about what you're about to do and so and 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 the, 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 really the, the astronaut's prayer is, oh Lord, please don't let me mess up. Uh, because, uh, you know, you're, you're out there to do something that is very important to you. You think it might, you think it's of importance to all of, uh, all of humanity. And, and so you're, you just, you know, if it's before your first spacewalk, I could do it in the pool, can I do it for real? Um, the, Actually, one of the happiest moments in my astronaut career is when I got assigned to my second mission, and it wasn't because I was flying with you, but that was that was a good that was a good part of it. Um, it was because that was in spite of it. Yeah, okay, and 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 so part of it is is you've been selected. NASA seems to have an obligation to fly you at least once, and they don't. But you know, you get the, you hope they have an obligation to fly you at least once, and then if they fly you a second time, it's sort of your the. The, your, the fellow, your, uh, your colleagues, the people with whom you are, are sharing this unusual profession have told you, you did okay, that you did well enough the first time that we're gonna let you do it again. And that's, uh, that, that, was a, that, was a, that was a nice time. There's an also an alternate way of looking at that. <clears throat> Some people said that I screwed up every time and they couldn't believe I would do it so many times in a row. <laughs> So the, the final question is, you gentlemen have been in a profession, you've been selected from thousands of other people. It's a very rare career, but yet you have a, something in common with just about everyone in this room, maybe everyone. You chose Friendswood as your home. Why? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I uh, actually got selected, like I said, 1998, and we had friends from the Navy uh, Dick and Chris Clark, who moved to Friendswood about a year prior to us. They got here in about 1997 to go work for NASA, not in the astronaut program, but in another job, another job at NASA. And so Dick said, hey, if you're coming down to look at houses, and Lori and I came down for a weekend to find a house to, to buy, and he said, make sure you look in Friendswood. So we got a realtor, and our realtor was married to an astronaut, and uh, had been a friend of ours for a while, and so she starts taking us all around Clear Lake. And for a whole day, I think all day Friday, all we're doing is looking at houses and Bay Oaks, Bay Forest, South Shore Harbor, everywhere over there on the other side of the freeway. And I kept saying, um, Amy, at some point, I want to see Friendswood. She said, okay, we'll get there, we'll get there. Well, Saturday comes, she's back driving us around over there. I said, can we go to Friendswood? And she said, tell you what, Mike, you get in my car, you drive, and I'll make some calls while we're heading over to Friendswood. I found out later, you know, and, and then we, we found the house that we love and bought and lived here 21 years. Found out later, Amy didn't know where Friendswood was. <laughs> Literally. She had been a realtor in Clear Lake for about two years. She had never shown a house on this side of the freeway. And she said, uh, a couple months ago, I bumped into her and I said, hey, Amy, do you remember that? that you, you know, and she said, well, yeah, I'd never been to Friendswood. Friendswood was dry. You know, I was young at that time. Why would I go to Friendswood? <laughs> so that's that's why we ended up here, because this is a, a great recommendation from some friends we trusted, and we knew the school district was great, and 
this was the kind of community that, that I had grown up in as a kid, so that's what I wanted to come back and raise my family here. So that's how we ended up here. Well, my wife and I are both country kids. I married the farmer's daughter. And um, we, we wanted to be out away from the Clear Lake area if we could. And uh, I had a, a sister-in-law and brother-in-law who had worked here at NASA in 76 or thereabouts. And so I had come down and visited them one time. And uh, so I, I had a little bit of a feel for what Friendswood was all about. So when I came down, I did the same thing. I had a realtor and said, they were showing me all over Clear Lake area. And I said, let's go further out and found a place and we've been here for over 40 years. We got here in uh, February of 79. Well, we're the Johnny Come Latelys. Uh, we've lived here in Friendswood for 10 years now. We lived in uh, uh, the Clear Lake area for 22 years. Um, and so uh, we, we had a very brief period of time uh, when uh, we came down from uh, Patuxent River, Maryland, to, and I think we had a day and a half to find a house. So we, we were pretty limited uh, in where we looked. And, and, my wife, when we, and so we picked a house and my wife said, you know, I really don't want to stay in this house forever. Said, you know, if you get selected for the astronaut program, let's, uh, let's find a different house. So I got selected for the astronaut program and 19 years later. <laughs> um, and, and, and so what we really, and, and you know, we, we, we're talking about the Gulf Freeway. It was interesting. When we lived in Clear Lake, we never came on this side of the Gulf Freeway. It's like it was the Great Wall of Southeast Texas. Um, now that we live here, we never, except, except my wife works, uh, still works at JSC. And so, but other than that, we never go on the other side of the Gulf Freeway. And, and, and so we, we decided it was time, we, we said, okay, finally, it's time to move. Um, and, uh, and we had a really good uh, uh, realtor, our younger daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, so, and, and so we really did, we, we wanted to move out of a Houston bedroom, uh, you know, the Houston suburbs. We wanted to go, we wanted to, we both grew up, we grew up in a very small little town, uh, uh, gosh, uh, 35, the population was 3,500 uh, when we were growing up and we got married and left and now the population is 3,498. Um, and so, and I tell you, the thing I love, I love voting here in Friendswood. I go pull into the parking, I love park, you know, pulling into the parking lot at, uh, at City Hall and going in and five minutes later I voted. I, you know, it, it's just, uh, it's got such a, it, it's, you know, it's a it's a small it it has a small town uh, feel without being really small. Um, you know, it's big enough that uh, got uh, I mean good restaurants, nice things to do. Uh, gosh, wonderful people, great schools, and uh, uh, we just uh, my I think my wife uh, will always hold it against me that I didn't let her move here sooner. Any recommendations on who to vote for? <laughs> Would you, by your applause, thank all three of our panelists? Oh. We also want to thank the Friendswood Rotary Club Foundation for underwriting a lot of these events this week. There are more to come tomorrow night at 6:30 here. Apollo 11 takes off again. If you haven't seen it, come tonight. Uh, tomorrow night at 6:30. It's a great film, Apollo 11 not Apollo 13, the other one, the other one. Wednesday at 4.30 and Friday at 4.30. And Kim, you may know the virtual reality. Are there still seats, are there still slots available for that? Okay, make reservations before you leave tonight for the virtual reality, Wednesday and Friday at 4.30. Those are by reservation only. Wednesday at seven o'clock, an adult event, the Splashdown Party at Brasserie 1895. Hmm. Details and tickets are at the so, website coming up on the screen. I think so. Oh, there we go. 50thApollo11.com. I think so, I'm not sure. That's Wednesday night from seven till nine. Thursday night here at the <laughs> library, two panel discussions back to back. The Apollo Flight Control panel discussion and the Apollo Recovery discussion. That's Thursday night here at 7. Saturday, just make your whole day Stevenson Park. 
have your kids sign up for the rocket launch. You can do that online at the website. Also, there'll be a concert. There'll be a, a car show from the Apollo era and some surprises too. I heard about a little earlier tonight from the people that are planning this. Again, all the details, 50thapollo11.com. So thank you again for coming. Thanks to all the folks at the library that helped to put on these events. Have a great evening. And if I might, one more uh, reminder, my beautiful wife is at the back at the table with books to sell, and I'll be back there in a minute to autograph them. Thanks.